here. Councillor Sabi George, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Flynn, Councillor Janey, Councillor McCarthy, Councillor O'Malley, Councillor Presley, Councillor Wu, and Councillor Zakem. Madam President, we have a quorum. Thank you, Madam Clerk. I've been informed by the clerk that a quorum is present. At this time, I would like all counselors, all guests, colleagues to please rise as Council O'Malley comes uh, forward to present the clergy for the day to give us an invocation. At, after the invocation, I ask that all guests and colleagues remain standing as Council O'Malley leads us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Madam President. Good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, I am delighted to introduce and bring for our uh, opening prayer today the Reverend Annie Rousseau. Uh, I we were talking on our way in. I believe this is uh, Reverend Rousseau's seventh time before this body. I've invited her every year that I've been in office. Uh, she's an amazing spiritual leader and community leader, not only in the neighborhood of Jamaica Plain, but really throughout the city of Boston. Uh, Reverend Rousseau also serves as the Chief Financial Officer for Metropolitan Boston Housing Partnership, Inc., the state's largest region regional provider of rental voucher assistance serving the homeless, elderly, disabled, and low and moderate income low and moderate income residents of Boston and 29 surrounding communities. Previously, she served as the chaplain at Jermaine Lawrence, a residential school which provides superior treatment services in New England for adolescent girls with complex behavioral, psychological, and learning challenges. Uh, and Annie spent six years as the board president of the Cooperative Metropolitan Ministries, which is the oldest interfaith organization in the area. Um, many of you know her from her incredible political uh, experience and uh, wonderful leadership that she has shown. Uh, Annie and her wife Nancy live in Jamaica Plain, and they are all also fantastic chefs, both of them. She is our dear friend. Please join me in welcoming the Reverend Annie Rousseau. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor O'Malley. Let us pray. God of all nations and peoples, we ask that you quiet our minds and open our hearts so that we may enter into the presence of all that is holy, just, and good. God of awesome holiness, bless these public servants today, Andrea, Michael, Anissa, Ayana, Michelle, Lydia, Ed, Frank, Tim, Matt, Kim, Josh, and Mark. Grant them the power of discernment to know what is right and good for all who call Boston their home. Multiply their courage so that they dare to accept the challenges that diminish and separate us. Inspire them so that they may be the source of bold ideas. Grace them with sensitivity so that they may be compassionate leaders of our city. God of power, strengthen them to help shape a city where all our children will be free of the burdens of racism and sexism, fear, and violence. A city where all people work with dignity, are rewarded fairly, and respected fully. God of glory, together, let us shape a city where our mutual values are reflected in decent homes affordable to all, good schools, safe neighborhoods, glad gatherings, respected differences, a city where older persons are not forgotten, but honored for their experience, cherished for their gifts, and sought for their wisdom. God of mercy, strengthen them in us to help shape a city where life's poetry is realized, justice attained, joy persuasive, and hope lived. We ask your blessing too on their families, colleagues, and dedicated staff that support them in the work that belongs to all of us. Together with you and with each other, may we build a city where diversity is a source of enrichment, neighborhoods are respected and made strong, communities become more inclusive, a city that is beautiful, true, and worthy of your promise to us. Amen.
I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Ready, Madam Clerk? That's it. Uh, Madam Clerk, if you could please amend the attendance record to add Councilor Presley. Thank you. At this time, we'll uh, move to approval of the minutes. If there are no objections to be made, hearing and seeing no objections, the uh, minutes are so approved. Communications from His Honor the Mayor. Docket number 0314. Message in order to reduce the FY18 appropriation for reserve for collective bargaining by $1,769,878 to provide funding for various departments for the FY18 increases within the collective bargaining agreement between the City of Boston and SEIU Local 888. Docket number 0315, message in order approving the supplemental appropriation of $1,769,878 for various departments for the FY18 to cover cost items contained within the collective bargaining agreements between the City of Boston and the SEIU Local 888. The terms of the contract are... October 1st, 2016 through September 30th, 2017, and October 1st, 2017 through September 30th, 2020. The major provisions of the contract include base wage increases of 2% effective the first pay period of each fiscal year. The agreements also include other benefits, including new steps beginning in July 2018 filed in the city clerk's office on February 26, 2018. Docket 0314 through 0315 will be placed in the Committee on Ways and Means. Docket number 0316, message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend an amount of $34,800 in the form of a grant for the Bank on Boston program awarded by Boston Redevelopment Authority to be administered by the new urban mechanics. The grant would fund day-to-day -day oversight of Bank on Boston program. Uh, thank you, Madam Clerk. At this time, the chair seeks to suspend the rules and pass this grant. Um, the grant will fund the program manager position for the Bank on Boston program that the mayor launched this past fall. The program is set to roll out this winter or in the spring. At this time, the chair moves for suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0316. All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Docket 0316 has been passed. Docket number 0317, message in order for the confirmation of the appointment of Dr. Jennifer Childs Roshak as a member of the Boston Public Health Commission's Board of Health for term expiring January 15, 2021. Would you like me to read the second one? That'd be great. Thank, Thank you. you. Docket number 0318, message in order for the confirmation of the appointment of John Fernandez as a member of the Boston Public Health Commission's Board of Health for term expiring January 15, 2021. Docket 0317 through 0318 will be assigned to the Committee on Healthy Women, Families, and Communities. Docket number 0319, message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend an amount of $5,000 in the form of a grant for Black History Month awarded by Brigham and Women's Hospital to be administered by the City Council. The grant would fund the City's Black History Month event. Uh, docket 0319, at this time the chair will move, will move for suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0319, but just to give a little context, this grant has come from <coughs> Brigham and Women's Hospital specifically to fund the, Black, the Council's Black History Month event, which is scheduled for this evening. I hope to see all of you there. Um, so the chair moves for suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0319. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All, any opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Docket 0319 has been passed. 
Reports of public officers and others, Madam Clerk. Madam President, uh, would you like me to read 0320 through 0331? That'd be great, thank you. Thank you. Docket number 0320, notice is received from the Mayor of the reappointment of Dion Irish as a member of the Public Facilities Commission for term expiring January 3rd, 2022. Docket number 0321, notice was received from the mayor of the reappointment of Catherine Craven as a member of the Public Facilities Commission for a term expiring January 3rd, 2022. Docket number 0322, notice was received from the mayor of the reappointment of Larry Momoli as a member of the Public Facilities Commission for a term expiring January 3rd, 2022. Docket number 0323, notice was received from the mayor of the appointment of Anne Marie Noonan as interim director of labor relations, effective February 12th, 2018. Docket number 0324, communication was received from Ronald W. Rakow, assessing commissioner of the appointment of Christopher Lynch as an assistant assessor. Docket number 0325, communication was received from Brian P. Golden, Director of the Boston Planning and Development Agency regarding proposed minor modifications to the Fenway Urban Renewal Pro Plan, project number MASS R-115 with respect to parcel 27. Docket number 0326, notice was received from the police commissioner in accordance with section three of the Boston Trust Act regarding civil immigrant immigration detainers resulting from calendar year 2017. Docket number 0327, notice was received from the city clerk in accordance with chapter six of the ordinances of 1979 regarding actions taken by the mayor on papers acted upon by the city council on February 7th, 2018. Docket number 0328, notice was received from the mayor of the appointment of Gail Willette as commissioner of assessing effective February 15th, 2018. Docket number 0329, notice was received from the mayor of his absence from the city from nine o'clock a.m. on Monday, February 19th, 2018, until 12 p.m. on Wednesday, February 21st, 2018. Docket number 0330, communication was received from the city clerk of the filing by the Boston Planning and Development Agency of the third amendment to the report and decision on the Bridgeview Apartments Chapter 121A project. And docket number 0331, communication was received from the city clerk of the filing by the Boston Planning and Development Agency on the application for the Old Colony Phase 3A Chapter 121A project. Docket 0320 through docket 0331 will be placed on file. Docket number 0332, notice was received from the city clerk of the filing of the Greenway Business Improvement District known as BID petition. Docket 0332 will be assigned to the Committee on Planning, Development and Transportation. Madam Clerk, reports of committees. Docket number 0168, the Committee on Planning, Development and Transportation, to which was referred on January 24th, 2018, docket number 0168, order regarding a medical marijuana dispensary at 1524 VFW Parkway in West Roxbury, submits a report recommending the order ought to pass. At this time, the Chair recognizes Council Wu, Chair of the Committee on Chair of the Committee on Planning, Development, and Transportation. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I'm going to refer to the, the sponsor and district counselor for the area in which the proposed medical marijuana dispensary uh, will be located for further comment. Just want to outline that this step is part of uh, sort of standard operating procedure given the Department of Public Health's uh, process for how applicants for medical marijuana dispensary licenses need to proceed. In order to move forward, they need to get a letter of support or non-opposition from either the mayor or city council of that uh, municipality that they're seeking to open in. So on last Thursday, we held a hearing on Beacon Compassion Center's proposal to open at 1524 VFW Parkway. Uh, they, are, they have told us that this would be one of three locations that they are seeking approval for across the state and had members of their team answer various questions that many of our colleagues had posed. Uh, they did mention that they 
are agreeing to a proviso that this would be only uh, approved for medical marijuana purposes and um, had gone through a lengthy community process as requested and um, guided by the district councilor. So I'll defer to our district councilor, Matt O'Malley, for further comment, but uh, would like to move passage of, sorry, <laughs> would like to move for acceptance of the committee report and passage of the docket, which would mean we would issue that standard um, letter of non-opposition. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Wu. Councilor O'Malley, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, for the thorough process. Um, and we are joined by several of the, the owner, Rena, and her team from Beacon Compassion, who's with us in the chamber today. I first met with Beacon Compassion a better part of a year, or more than a year ago now, um, in, this very cha in, this, in this very hall, not in this chamber. Uh, and I had two requests. One, to agree to be a medicinal only facility and to conduct as robust a community process as humanly possible. Uh, I am very satisfied that they have agreed to both. Uh, in fact, there was a time where uh, they had requested uh, some action to be taken earlier and I said that I was not comfortable doing that and would not do that until they were able to meet with more people, engage more neighbors, and they did just that. Uh, so there are four different neighborhood and civic associations that I want to touch upon that have agreed to uh, uh, issue also letters of non-opposition. Uh, one was the West Roxbury Neighborhood Council, I believe that was the first one, which is a, an app mayoral appointed board that oversees and deals with sort of zoning for the entire neighborhood. Uh, the second, I believe, was the West Roxbury Civic and Improvement Association, which is a civic association concerning primarily the neighborhoods of Washington Street, sort of east into Councilor McCarthy's district, abutting Councilor McCarthy's district, uh, which is a close by neighborhood association. Uh, the third was the 1515 VFW Parkway uh, Trailer Park, which is Boston's only trailer park, which I am proud to represent, a thriving, wonderful community, uh, which is the closest to Butters, residential Butters, to Beacon Compassion's proposed location. Uh, that ended up writing a letter of non-opposition as well. And then fourthly, the Charles River Spring Valley Neighborhood Association, which I guess would be the most, the closest neighborhood association for this proposed location. All four uh, bodies either wrote letters or took statements uh, in non-opposition, uh, provided that this facility remain a medi uh, medicinal marijuana only, which was my position as well. Um, it wasn't easy to do, and there are many questions that uh, being compassion had to deal with the neighbor, but they did that, and I commend them for conducting as robust a process as we've seen for a business like this. Uh, no, it's just still, that one, right? this, you know, we are dealing with this now because this is the law of the land, and there seems to be some confusion as we get to recreational. Um, but one of the reasons why I feel so strongly that medicinal only is needed is because that's precisely what this is. This is medicine. Um, we don't have to get into because we all know what the, the scourge of opiates has been. And in many cases, for many patients, medicinal marijuana is a far preferable treatment to help to deal with someone who's dealing with a chronic uh, or fatal disease. Um, we've all lost loved ones. I, many of you know, it's three years ago next month that I lost my sister to cervical cancer. Uh, towards the end of her life, she was given medicinal marijuana and it helped her quality of her life. Uh, the fact that it helped her eat half a cheeseburger when she couldn't keep food down is something that will always stick with me is, is a great memory in an otherwise incorrigible time. Um, so this is the, what this is about. I've heard from some people who are very upset about this, and I, and I understand it. This is, this is, this is a change. Uh, but the fact that we're talking about a medical facility staffed by medical professionals is why I support non-opposition to this site as medicinal only, and that is precisely what Beacon Compassion has agreed to. Um, so. There we will, we have asked them and they have agreed to include a proviso before zoning, which reads, this treatment center is limited to med med medical marijuana use only, which I believe is similar to what Patriot Care um, and perhaps one other facility has used as well. Um, but I will be echoing the chair's request that this uh, body today ratify this and pass this. And uh, thank you to Beacon for not only your commitment to being medicinal only, but having a robust public safety plan, having a man trap or a sally port, uh, initially working with Boston police to have a uh, police duty on detail for the beginning as, as it opens up and to really work to address many questions. So um, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to my colleagues for their participation. Thank you, uh, Council Malley, and thank you for sharing um, at this time, Councilor Wu moves, moves for acceptance of the committee report and passage <laughs> of docket 0168. All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. 
Docket 0168 has been passed and the operator will be granted our standard letter of non-opposition. Docket 01. With, with that proviso that it will remain exclusively for medicinal marijuana. Thank you, Council Malley. Madam Clerk. Docket number 0139, Committee on Planning and Development and Transportation to which is referred on January 24th, 2018. Docket number 0139, message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend two grants from the Massachusetts Gaming Commission for a cumulative amount of $250,000. The purpose of the grant is to fund a portion of the city's costs for the design of the Rutherford Avenue slash Sullivan Square project. Submits a report recommending the order ought to pass. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, chair recognizes Council Ruth, uh, the, chair, the chair of the Committee on Planning, Development, and Transportation. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, this, I think as mentioned at our last meeting two weeks ago, we had just before that meeting had a hearing on this particular grant, $250,000 from the Mass Gaming Commission to fund this, uh, to help the city pay less in terms of our obligation that we're sharing with the state to get to 25% design for this corridor, uh, something that's been 20 years in the making. And uh, at the hearing, there, was some, there were some questions that came up about design alternatives and whether particular alternatives had been evaluated and to what degree. So we had paused last meeting to give a chance uh, for the transportation department and um, some proponents of an alternative design to huddle up. Uh, that meeting has happened and while there are still questions that I know the district counselor will be pursuing further, um, my intention was never to hold up the design, which, uh, sorry, the grant, which is uh, going to reduce the city's obligation. We want some design to happen. We want the project to happen. Uh, the residents of Charlestown desperately need the infrastructure improvements there to relieve the traffic situation, particularly with all the development planned in the area. Uh, and so we want to get them to that design and stay on track for the federal funding to happen. And I think they're, they're, you know, we'll continue to have conversations about what exactly that design contains. So we'd move for acceptance of the report and passage of this grant. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Wu. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? No. Okay. At this time, Councilor Wu moves for acceptance of the committee report and passage of docket 0139. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it, docket 0139 has been passed. Docket number 0164, order for hearing regarding the fiscal year 2018 Boston Public Schools transportation budget. Councilor Sabi George, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, yesterday I chaired a productive hearing regarding the fiscal year 2018 BPS, school, uh, BPS transportation budget. And I'd like to thank all of my colleagues. Everyone was there at some point yesterday uh, for attending this uh, very thorough and thoughtful hearing. We heard from John Hanlon, Chief of Operations for BPS, as well as Rob Consalvo, Chief of Staff for the Superintendent of uh, Boston Public Schools, as well as a number of other folks that le lent their voices during the uh, hearing. BPS is anticipating a total spending for fiscal year 18 to be $123 million. That's $7 million more than what we were presented with during the fiscal year 18 budget process. Much of this rise is due to the cost of our driver and bus contract and related costs to um, the exception times, um, which is when the driver is driving beyond what is designated in part of their contract and route, and for standby drivers who are acting as backup drivers performing routes when active drivers are not available. There are currently 35 of the 750 bus drivers suspended with pay, a few of them under investigation through the Department of uh, Children and Families, and a, um, a number of them only for other reasons, and those are ongoing investigations, but unfortunately they are out currently with pay, uh, which is a substantial expense to the district. The contract with TransDev, the current transportation vendor, will be expiring at the end of this school year, and BPS is currently in the process of putting out an RFP uh, for the next contract cycle. We were also informed that BPS is uh, in the process of leading an opt-out campaign, uh, started at the uh, beginning of this school year and continuing through the year, to identify students who do not ride the school buses, although they are uh, assigned to a bus. And this opt-out could help reduce the number of bus stops and routes. So far, 2,200 students 
have been taken off of this list, and this reduction um, has certainly helped realize some savings, and over a period of time, they hope to uh, realize a few more. When a family opts out of transportation, there is always an opportunity to come back on uh, to a bus route should family circumstances change. A large percentage of our transportation spending, over $56,000 per student, is to transport students to private education facilities requiring, uh, when students require special ed services, out of district. There are currently 166 students being transported to 63 different locations. This is a growing number of students, uh, but they've been identified as requiring these out of district placements. I um, was certainly displeased, not thrilled to hear of this increase in spending for this current fiscal year, uh, but trust that BPS is looking for ways to improve um, family engagement and, and reduce, reduce spending. And they have you know, set some goals to realize those savings, whether it's a conversation and hopes to change some bell times, looking to create more efficient routes, working on that opt-out plan. All of those are good pieces and, and parts of the conversation as well as a few others. Uh, but my advice to BPS and certainly central to our conversation is always making sure that we put the child first, um, but also while looking to meet budget expectations. Uh, certainly for our efforts here on the council. And I thank you all for uh, joining yesterday and participating in a, uh, a very mm -hmm. robust and thoughtful conversation. Thank you, Council President. Thank you, Councilor Saibu George. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? Councilor O'Malley, you have the floor. Just briefly wanted to thank uh, uh, Chairwoman of the Education Committee uh, for her leadership on this, and, and she did a, a fantastic job sort of illustrating what, what we heard. One thing that, that stuck with me, and I've been thinking a lot about, was the private out-of-district placement. We're up to 166 students in a st student population of 56,000. That doesn't seem that high, but that number has gone up. And the fact that we are paying on average $56,000 for the transportation of these students, not the tuition, that comes from a whole other bucket of money, $56,000 per student times 166 students is $9.2 million. Now, admittedly, some students need services that we cannot offer, but we shouldn't be satisfied with that number growing from 140 something to 166 because not only should we be able to set, to service the needs of every student in Boston, um, but it also would save us money. If there are 63 different sites, I don't know what the breakdown is, some need one-on-one, -on -one, but you would think there would be at least a handful of students per school, two, three, um, that's $150,000. You can't tell me that we couldn't offer a specialist at a salary. Uh, that would be able to keep this student in-house and be able to save money in the long run. So I know that this is a conversation we all shared as we get to the budget here, and I think that's something that we really need to focus on, uh, and BPS needs to focus on as well. Thank you. Thank you, Council O'Malley. At this time, Docket 0164 will remain in the Committee on Education. Docket number 0257, message in order approving the City of Boston to accept the right to enforce a use restriction to ensure that the Huntington Theater re continues to be used as a theater or sim similar cultural use. The Chair recognizes Councillor Janey, uh, the Chair on Committee of Arts, Culture and Special Events. Thank you, Madam President. Um, as you mentioned, Docket number 0257, message in order approving the City of Boston to accept the right to enforce a use restriction to ensure that the Huntington Theater continues to be used as a theater or similar cultural use was referred to the Committee on Arts, Culture, and Special Events on February 7th. I had a hearing on this matter on February 27th to hear testimony. At that time, we heard from uh, Joyce Linehan, Chief of Policy, and Jonathan Green Greeley from the BBTDA. Um, and they give a presentation. Uh, what is important to recognize is that this project is mixed use. In addition to keeping the theater uh, for 100 years as a cultural use, we will also have over 400 residential units as well as retail and restaurant space. There are additional community benefits, including additional cultural space as well as uh, an accessible entrance that will be added to this project, as well as donations uh, to parks and sidewalk improvements. In addition, when this project is completed, it will generate approximately $2 million in annual property tax that the city can then use 
Uh, we also heard at that time the directors of the Huntington Theater and the Fenway Alliance who attended the hearing, and they testified in full support of accepting the right to enforce a use restriction to ensure that the Huntington Theater continues to be used as a theater or a similar cultural use over the next 100 years. So, so based on this information and the testimony that was presented at the hearing, um, I respectfully ask that this matter ought to pass. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councilor Janey. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? At this time, Councilor Janey moves for adoption of the committee report and passage of docket 0257. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Docket, zero, docket 0257 has been passed. Motions, orders, and resolutions. Docket number 0333, Councilor Zakim and Baker offer the following ordinance, amending chapter nine of the City of Boston Code, ordinances regarding eviction data collection. Councilor Zakim, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam President. This is a uh, refile that Councilor uh, Baker and I worked on last year in uh, conjunction with the uh, Jim Brooks Stabilization, Stabilization Act, otherwise uh, known as Just Cause Eviction. Um, which you know this body and the mayor sent up to the state house uh, last year, but there were some components of the bill that we wanted to try and put in place quickly, uh, particularly around where evictions were happening in the city of Boston. And after the series of hearings we did here, um, we held here on the Jim Brooks Act. <clears throat> excuse me. What stood out uh, from the testimony was that tenants, um, by folks who are facing eviction, need to be informed of their rights in the process. That Massachusetts, while we can always do better, has pretty strong protections. The problem was. Many folks didn't know about those options until it was too late. Uh, so what this bill would do would require that folks who are uh, issuing eviction notices or lease non-renewal notices to tenants in the city of Boston, and there are some exemptions in here for smaller landlords, for public housing, uh, et cetera, but um, would be required also to send to the city's Office of Housing Stability uh, a notification of this uh, impending eviction, along with the tenant's name, address, et cetera. And the Office of Housing Stability is then able to one track where these are happening instead of going up to the courthouse every few months, which we've heard from Chief Dillon and others is uh, laborious and often, uh, I'm not saying unproductive, but often creates more work for folks to then sort through all the information we get. So we'll have that information in more real time, but just as importantly, even more importantly, we'll make sure that these tenants who are facing eviction are informed of their rights uh, in, a, in a timely manner provided with resources both from the city and the nonprofit agencies such as Greater Boston Legal Services, the Harvard Legal Aid Bureau, uh, City Life, Vita Urbana, the other organizations that have been working with people facing foreclosures. So I think this is important um, as we talk over and over um, and we read over and over and we hear over and over from our constituents about the uh, rising cost of housing and the uh, dangers of displacement and the troubles we're having here in the city of Boston. I think this is important. This is something that the city council can do without approval from the state legislature. Um, although I, we know we all have faith in our colleagues up there, I think we can probably move a little more quickly on this and enacting it and making sure that we're protecting homeowners and uh, tenants in the city of Boston. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Zakem. Would anyone like to add their name to this? Madam Clerk, if you could please add Councilor Siomo, Councilor Edwards, Councilor Asabi George, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Flynn, Councilor Janey, Councilor O'Malley, Councilor Presley, Councilor Wu in the chair. Docket 0333 will be assigned to the Committee on Government Operations. Docket number 0334, Councilor Presley offered the following resolution, urging the state legislature to support House Bill 3586, an act relative to justice involved women. Councilor Presley, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. First, I would like to thank our colleague in government uh, who has uh, long been a stalwart and a leader uh, in a topic often overlooked. I want to thank State Representative Kay Khan for introducing this bill and act relative to justice involved women as a critical approach to address the unique needs of the growing population of incarcerated women. Family reunification is critical to reducing recidivism and building healthy communities when citizens re-enter our neighborhoods. And women certainly play an integral part of our families in the fabric of our city, uh, representing 53.3% uh, 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 of our population uh, in the city of Boston. 
um, almost 40% of single female headed households. And so when we continue to see the number of incarcerated, incarcerated women growing, that is incredibly destabilizing, especially since we're talking about uh, many of them being separated from their children and those children then going uh, into the system. Uh, just to share some numbers in terms of breakdown, because I think often we can uh, stereotype, in fact, who is incarcerated. Most women who are incarcerated, uh, again, one in four are a survivor of physical or sexual violence, uh, some form of trauma, who have then uh, self-medicated to treat that trauma, and so have in turn uh, developed a substance abuse um, uh, disorder. Uh, many of them are battling mental health challenges, uh, and so uh, they really should not be incarcerated. And so the fact that they are incarcerated, that this is destabilizing families in our communities, it really is incumbent upon us uh, to be uh, gender competent and specific as we are thinking about strategies um, uh, around uh, rehabilitation mm -hmm. and also reentry. Uh, the debate uh, is ongoing relative uh, to uh, sentencing and punishment of crimes, um, but we need to make sure that we're also talking about uh, rehabilitation and reentry, and specifically for this population, uh, which for so long has been overlooked and is unfortunately growing. Uh, this legislation, if passed, means that ostensibly we'll institutionalize a panel that will allow us to collect the data. Um, and I know it sounds uh, a bit rote <laughs> that I refer to so many things as a public health crisis, but I think the destabilization of our families is a public health crisis. And that public health crisis is also um, you know, affecting uh, our economy and civic life and, and so many other things. And so like any other public health crisis, we have to study it and we need the data uh, to better address it. And so that's what this legislation will accomplish uh, if passed. And so today I ask uh, that we suspend and pass. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Presley. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? Add your name. Madam Clerk, if you could add uh, Councilor Baker, Councilor Siomo, Councilor Edwards, Councilor Sabi George, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Flynn, Councilor Janey, Councilor McCarthy, Councilor O'Malley, Councilor Wu, Councilor Zakum, as well as the chair. At this time, Councilor Presley moves for a suspension of the rules and passage of docket 033, an adoption of docket. Go ahead, Councilor Presley. I apologize, very out no of problem. order, but this is what happens. Uh, I was ad-libbing a bit. I do just want to give the good work of, of our uh, fellow colleague, uh, Justice, and make sure that I punctuate specifically what we're about to affirm here mm -hmm. as a body. And so uh, in addition to uh, the data and research to find best practices to ensure that uh, this panel makes recommendations that are gender, responsi gender responsive and trauma-informed to support justice-involved women, this will include family visitation, Again, speaking to my point about maintaining familial bonds, reproductive health care, again, also something often overlooked, pretrial services, reducing harm to families, and again, maximizing rehabilitation practices to ensure successful reentry into the community. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Presley. I will say this, um, I, I, if anyone wants to remove their name after hearing that, we can talk about that at a different point, but um, just so as not to embarrass anybody. So for right now, exactly, for right, exactly. So for right now, on docket number 0334, Councilor Presley moves for suspension of the rules and adoption of the resolution. Um, all those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it, docket zero, the rules have been suspended and docket 0334 has been adopted. Docket number 0335, Council Siomo offered the following order for hearing regarding post audit budget review. <laughs> docket 0335 will be assigned to the Committee on Ways and Means. Docket number 0336, Councilor Edwards offered the following resolution to support the March for Our Lives and Comprehensive Action to halt the epidemic of gun violence. Councilor Edwards, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Madam President. I think it's very evident that um, many people here already have been impacted by shooting and violence in our country. I distinctly recall in 1999, I was a senior in high school when Columbine happened. And while that was in Colorado, and I was in a small town in Michigan, we, I still certainly felt the effect and felt fear suddenly of trying to go to school. What we're seeing increasingly is that that fear is not only growing, but that it's impacting the way people go to school, but also how they teach. Um, to bring up my uh, colleague yesterday, she had incredible um, 
my colleague, uh, Councillor Anissa Asabi George, mm -hmm. had incredible comments yesterday that were quite emotional about how the impact on teachers and that we ask already so much of them to come to school and to compensate and to compensate and now apparently to potentially also <laughs> wage war on other students to protect our own. This is, to echo uh, my, co uh, my colleagues' comments, this is also a public health crisis. This is a health crisis of gun violence in the United States. And I thought it was important that we as the city of Boston stand firmly in solidarity in this conversation while we may not have, thank God, have not had, had a, a school shooting, uh, we do have violence on our streets that is directly related to gun violence. The statistics are staggering. Uh, when we did the research for this, for this resolution, the fact that uh, since 1968, the number of gun-related uh, violent deaths is actually the more than any of, of all the wars combined that we've had since our inception. The fact that um, since 2012, Sandy Hook, we've had um, 239 school shootings, of, uh, of which 138 people have, have, have been perished or have been killed. We are in, uh, this has been declared a public health crisis by the American Public Health Association. And so I bring this up um, not only because we need to firmly express our solidarity and that when they grieve, when people grieve around this country, Boston grieves too. The fear that they fear, we, we also feel here. But also to be very clear, there are children leading the way in this conversation and that we should also be proud about the fact that they are stepping up in such huge ways. There will be a march for our lives here in March in Boston. I certainly will be there and I hope my colleagues will also be there to show our solidarity, to stand behind them and to be the advocates that they so desperately need in our go government and also to push for um, reasonable gun control uh, in, our, in our state, including um, the Extreme Risk Pr Protective Order, House Bills H3081. So in short, I'm gonna close my remarks. I'm, I'm sure that many of you already resoundingly support standing with these kids and standing up for a society where we don't fear going to school and where our teachers are more than prepared to educate our kids, not necessarily to have to defend them. And so I'll close the remarks and um, leave it at that. <laughs> Would you like to, uh, oh, yes, Councilor Edwards, move for suspend, yes. suspension of the rules and yes, thank adoption, you. okay. Thank you, Councilor Edwards. Uh, Councilor Sabi George, you have the floor. Thank you again, Madam President. I rise today to thank the Maker Council Edwards and ask that my name be added. As a former Boston Public School teacher, as a mother, as a chair of the Committee on Education, I take this issue very seriously. It is a topic that keeps me up at night. It is a conversation I have had with my children. It is a conversation I've had with my office. It is a conversation I've had with my colleagues in education and it's one I've had with residents across the city of Boston. It's one that we had um, last night. We are losing innocent lives across the country and in our great city because of gun violence. For many of our students, schools are their safety net, the most stable part of their lives. I thought of school shootings in the vicinity of our school buildings. The thought of shootings in the vicinity of our school buildings is a painful nightmare that weighs on, weighed on me throughout my teaching career and it doesn't fail to keep me up now as a parent and as a city councilor. Whether this is a conversation about regulating guns, bringing more support for our youth and their families into our school, schools, and for us to use as a community simply caring more about each other before it becomes a crisis. We need to do more. I stand with our youth, our families, and our communities in the city of Boston and across the United States who are working to make every life to making every life um, one that is allowed to be lived to its fullest potential. And I um, thank you for the opportunity to speak and thank you, Councilor Edwards. Thank you, Councilor Sabi George. Madam Clerk, if you could add Councilor Sabi George's name. Councilor Janey, you have the floor. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you so much, Councilor Edwards, for offering this. I appreciate your leadership and I too would like to add my name. I stand in solidarity with the young people across the country, certainly in Florida and um, certainly here in our own communities. This is a very serious issue, and we need to also recognize as our young people lead the way, as they always do, young people are always at the forefront of all important social justice movements, um, that as they lead, lead the way on this issue, that we will be there with them, that we will acknowledge their pain, and that we will hear their voice and give them space to lead the way. I think it's also important, though, that we recognize that while we are very fortunate 
and that we have not had a serious mass shooting here in Boston. Our young people every single day are experiencing gun violence and trauma in their own communities. And they too have been organizing and fighting against this issue. And so we need to do more as a body, as a city, to make sure that our young people have the resources that they need and um, not just the resources that we're dealing with the trauma in our communities. And so I, I'm proud to stand with you and my other colleagues here on this body in support of this resolution. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Janey. Madam Clerk, if you could add Councilor Janey's name. Councilor Presley, you have the floor. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam President. And, uh, thank you, Councilor Edwards, for uh, putting this forward. Um, as we were saying in recent weeks, you know, resolutions uh, are uh, a way for us to uh, affirm and double down on our values um, and certainly us supporting a youth voice and doing everything possible uh, to stem the scourge of this public health epidemic that is gun violence um, is certainly a value of this body. So thank you for putting this forward. Um, I also just wanted to um, affirm uh, the words that have already been said and that there is no hierarchy of hurt here. And I want to say that because there are um, forces at work that would lead you to believe something else. Um, there is solidarity in the survivor movement. There is no hierarchy of hurt here. Um, whether uh, we are robbed of a life, and that's what it is. It, we should never say a loss of life. We have been, these lives were stolen from us. So whether we are robbed of a life in a school, at a concert, in a church, or on a city block, you know, what that violence leaves in its wake is generational trauma in those impacted communities and for those families, a permanent empty seat at that dining room table. And so uh, we will not allow the powers that be to pit survivors against one another and we will affirm youth voice. What I love about activism is that there is neither an eligibility age or a shelf life. And these young people are certainly uh, affirming that. And so uh, we should, uh, in the words of Councilor Jania, uh, continue to, to follow their lead. And finally, I would just uh, say, I am really sick and tired of people using uh, survivors uh, who have lost or had uh, the lives robbed uh, from them, uh, who've been impacted by gun violence, using survivors as political fodder or for photo ops. It has got to stop. So thank you again for this resolution and I ask to have my name added. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Presley. Madam Clerk, if you could add Councilor Presley's name. Council Malley, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I think the, the previous speakers and we're able to much more eloquently articulate what I'm feeling, what many of us are feeling. So I just wanted to add one thing as it relates to this march, is that the young people of Parkland, Florida, uh, have given me incredible hope in that tragedy. The fact that they have pushed back, challenged, um, and really, I think, articulated what needs to be said, what needs to be done. We are sick of this. This has to end now. So if nothing else, I hope that the young people uh, of Stoneman Douglas Elementary particularly, but others that are putting this march together, and particularly those in our city that are leading the way, will help us retire that tired trope that Gen Z or millennials are apathetic or out of touch because they have shown more courage than many members of Congress and this president as it relates to doing something about gun violence. So please add my name, look forward to supporting this. Thank you, Council O'Malley. Madam Clerk, if you could add Council O'Malley's name, if you could add Councilor Baker, Councilor Siomo, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Flynn, Councilor McCarthy, Councilor Wu, Councilor Zakum, as well as the chair. At this time, Councilor Edwards moves for suspension of the rules and adoption of docket number 0336. All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Docket 0336 has been adopted. Personnel orders, Madam Clerk. Docket number 0337, Councilor Campbell for Councilor Sabi George. Uh, Councilor Sabi George moves for suspension of the rules and adoption and passage of docket 0337. All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Docket 0337 has been passed. Docket number 0338. Councilor Campbell for Councilor Sabi George. Councilor Sabi George moves for suspension <coughs> of the rules and passage of docket 0338. All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Docket 0338 has been passed. 
Docket number 0339, Councillor Campbell for Councillor Edwards. Councillor Edwards moves for suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0339. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. Dockets zero, the ayes have it, docket 0339 has been passed. Docket number 0340, Councillor Campbell, offer the following order. The chair moves for suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0340. All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it, docket 0340 has been passed. Docket number 0341, Councillor Campbell, offer the following order. Docket 0341, the chair moves for suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0341. All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it, docket 0341 has been passed. Docket no number 0342, Councilor Campbell, offer the, the following. The chair moves for suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0342. All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it, docket 0342 has been passed. This time, <clears throat> how many do we have? Just one, right? At this time, I'm informed by the clerk that we have one late file matter, which in the absence of objection will be added to today's agenda. Hearing and seeing no objection, the late file matter has been added. Madam Clerk, if you could read the first late file matter. And the only late file matter, thank you. <laughs> Offered by City Councilor Ayanna Presley. Resolution urging the state legislature to support House Bill 632 and House 4159 an act demanding justice for Massachusetts campus sexual assault survivors. Whereas nearly one in five women and one in 16 men will be victims of sexual violence in co on college campuses, yet despite its pervasiveness, it is often un underreported. Therefore, be it resolved that the Boston City Council in meeting assembled, go on record in support of House Bill 632 and House Bill 4159 to ensure Massachusetts colleges and universities remain intolerant of sexual violence and committed to the protection and security of victims and survivors within its jurisdiction. Filed on February 28th, 2018. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, Councilor Presley, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I apologize, apologize for the late file, but this is a, an important matter that's currently being debated at the State House. And again, um, uh, emblematic of the times that we are in, that I have to sit here and affirm something that we all agree is important and is so very obvious. Um, but I want to thank State Reps uh, Trisha Farley Bouvier and Lori Ehrlich, who authored these two bills aimed at protecting our students from campus sexual assault. I do think the stats bear repeating because many people think sexual assault uh, only affects women. Uh, this is a crime that does not discriminate. Campus sexual assault, uh, as uh, Madam uh, President alluded to, nearly one in five, I'm sorry, our clerk, nearly one in five women and one in 16 men will be victims of sexual violence on our college campuses. For those of you uh, who think the number one reason that people drop out of college is uh, financial uh, stress, um, actually the number one reason they drop out is campus sexual assault and the trauma that occurs and the, and the fact that uh, uh, it is very painful to have to see uh, um, your perpetrator on campus over and over again because so many of these campuses have not enforced and taken seriously um, the needs of survivors and getting them on a pathway to healing and also justice. And so what we've learned from an anonymous survey is what any survivor could tell you, this is still an underreported crime, has devastating and long effects on victims. So why are we here today? Because you all know all this already. The Obama administration crafted thoughtful guidelines for colleges and universities to follow for any and all cases of reported sexual violence to ensure that those one in five women that I spoke about in one in 16 men again get on a pathway to healing and uh, secure the justice that they deserve. But Secretary Betsy DeVos is undoing those protections and procedures and setting us back. Uh, so we thank uh, our local uh, leadership and representatives in Farley Bouvier and Ehrlich for ensuring that Massachusetts does not follow suit and put together instead legislation that will codify procedures aimed at justice for the victims and again a pathway to healing. So this legislation will ensure that the Obama era requirements of Title IX not only stay in place in the Commonwealth but actually are strengthened. 
This bill will require colleges and universities in Massachusetts to continue conducting research-based sexual misconduct surveys to provide ongoing prevention, education, and training programs for students and to assemble review panels tasked with implementing and monitoring campus response networks, holding us all collectively responsible. And so that is why I'm asking for your support for these two bills, so that we can send a message that here in Massachusetts, regardless of what that man that occupies the White House is doing and those who work under him, we have zero tolerance when it comes to sexual assault, and we stand with survivors. And so I uh, move to suspend the rules and adopt this resolution today. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Presley. Anyone else looking to speak on this matter? Madam Clerk, if you could add the following names. Councilor Baker, Councilor Siomo, Councilor Edwards, Councilor Sabi George, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Flynn, Councilor Janey, Councilor McCarthy, Councilor O'Malley, Councilor Wu, Councilor Zakum in the chair. At this time, Councilor Presley moves for suspension of the rules and adoption of the first um, and only late file matter. All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it, the late file matter has been adopted. At this time, anyone wishing to remove uh, a matter from the green sheets may do so at this time. Hearing none. Um, I'm informed by the clerk that there are zero late file matters um, to add to the consent agenda. At this time, the chair moves for adoption of the consent agenda. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. The consent agenda has been adopted. At this time, I will recognize Councillor O'Malley. For what I, purpose do you rise? I ask unanimous consent to make a brief statement. Yes. Well, thank you. Uh, if you'll indulge <laughs> me, sort of I have a brief note to read from our friend Bud Waite, uh, whom this council honored at our last meeting. Um, it reads, Dear Matt and the entire City Council, I was most appreciative and thrilled and honored with your invitation to the City Council meeting last week. It was a most gratifying experience. All the many years I've been a resident of Boston, this was the first time I had gone to the City Council chamber and a meeting. All the good things you have said about me over time have been great and so much thanks are in order. I was very honored to meet the many councilors with their congratulations and good wishes. Thanks to you, many thanks to my dear friend, Linda Denekamp, for taking good care of me all day. So to you, Matt, and <laughs> Jessica, and Bill, and your entire staff, thanks again for all your kindness and for all you've done for me and what you mean to me. Best wishes always, Bud Wait. P.S. If you have a chance, perhaps you could read this note at the council meeting. <laughs> when a World War II veteran and a French Legion of Honor uh, winner asks you to read a note at a council meeting, you, you do. do. So uh, Bud Wait, I think, joins Mr. McCarthy in watching this. So how about a, one more round of applause for our friend Bud Wait? Thank you. That is wonderful. Thank you so much, <laughs> Councilor O'Malley. Uh, Councilor Sabi George, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I request unanimous consent to make a brief statement as well. You have the floor. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, on Friday of this week, March 2nd, I am hosting a free CPR uh, training uh, for anyone here at City Hall uh, that would like to participate. I am covering the cost of the instructors, and we've got a number of folks signed up, and I'm excited about it. I'll also be providing lunch. Uh, so I do uh, ask if any of you, <laughs> we'll see, we'll see who shows up, um, but it'll be a good lunch, it'll be a good lunch, and I, uh, I look forward to um, getting recertified myself in CPR and uh, looking forward to certifying lots of folks here in the building, so thank you. Thank you, Councilor Sabi George, and thank you for extending the invitation um, to all of our offices as well. And speaking of lunch, just a friendly reminder that we have uh, Council Wu's lunch after the meeting today. Um, at this time, I would like all guests and members to please rise <laughs> as the Council prepares to adjourn today's meeting in memory of the following individuals. For Councilor Baker, Marion McDonough. For Councilor Edwards, Dolores Lazzarino. For Councilors Flaherty and Flynn, Carmine Cafasso, Joan Roberts, Teresa Fleming, and Helen Anderson. For Councilor Janey, Manuel Socota Cabral. For Councilor McCarthy, Ellen T. Patton, and Coach Hank Cutting. For Council O'Malley, Councilors O'Malley and Zakum, Deanne Kenny Stryker. And for all councilors, John Hines, Betty Davis Knott, 
and the student victims of the mass shooting at Mar Marjorie Stoneham Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. A moment of silence, please. Thank you. At this time, the chair moves that when the council adjourns today, it does so in memory of those aforementioned individuals. And we're scheduled to meet again on Wednesday, March 7th at 12 noon in this chamber at Boston City Hall. All those in favor of adjournment, say aye. aye. Any opposed, say nay. The ayes have it, the council is adjourned. <laughs>